It's right there. All right, Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8. By nature, we are selfish. By nature, we're egotistical. Everything's about us. Okay, we put ourselves in the middle of every situation. Part of the problem we have today as a society is we, we view everything subjectively. Okay, it's all about us. And we're, we're very subjective in all of our opinions, feelings, thoughts. Uh, we're not very objective. We don't look at the whole picture. Okay, we don't look at it from the outside. We're typically only concerned with ourselves and we are only concerned with the events taking place around us in as much as they impact us. Even contemporary Christianity is often very therapeutic in nature. Okay, many professing Christians approach the faith only with the concern of how it helps them live their best life right now. Right now. How does the faith help me? How does the faith save me? Okay, uh, how does it serve me? How does this message speak to me? How does the music stir me? What does this passage mean to me? This is basically contemporary Christianity. Uh, if you go on Google reviews, our church's only negative review was from a year ago from an anonymous critic, aren't they always? Simply known as SR, if you know who SR is, or if you are SR, shame on you. That's okay. That's what it says. Needs more subjects and life issues, preaching on Sunday a.m. I also need a grammar lesson. Okay. When visitors come, they want to hear a message that they can relate to during the entire week. Leave the teaching on particular chapters to a teaching setting. What he's saying is there, I need something that spoke to me. I don't want to hear God's word. I need something that speaks to me. Leave the teaching of the Bible somewhere else. Well, here's the problem. I'm called to feed the sheep, not feed the goats. Okay? And thank you, SR, whoever you are, for proving my point exactly. He probably left saying, that guy's talking all about Jesus and the gospel and his finished work and God's kingdom and love for others through evangelism. What does that have to do with me? Well, if you're a Christian, everything everything. On my birthday this year, my birthday is February 5th, just, so it's just a month ago. My birthday this year, the great country star, uh, music star Toby Keith passed away. I liked old Toby. Okay, he was a little rough around the edges, so am I. And I liked old Toby. He passed away from stomach cancer. He was 61 years old. He summed up the attitude of most of mankind with his 2001 hit, whose lyrics went something like this. We talk about your work, how your boss is a jerk. We talk about your church and your head when it hurts. We talk about the troubles you've been having with your brother and your daddy and your mother and your crazy ex-lover. We talk about your friends and the places that you've been. We talk about your skin and the devils on your chin, the polish on your toes and the run in your hose, and you know we're going to be talking about your clothes. And here's the chorus. You know talking about you makes me smile, but every once in a while... I want to talk about me. I want to talk about I. I want to talk about number one. Oh, my, me, my, what I think, what I like, what I know, what I want, what I see. I like talking about you, 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 usually, but occasionally I want to talk about me. And it repeats me about 500 times. The title of the song, if you cannot tell, is called I Want to Talk About Me. And it's really backwards. Okay, he says here, you know, I like talking about you usually, but occasionally I want to talk about me. That's not true. Usually we want to talk about me usually. We want to talk about us. Okay, I'm guilty of it. I'm guilty. I, I have to check myself. Don't take over a conversation. Don't take over a conversation. Why? Because that's my sinful nature. It's there. I want, to, I want to put me in the middle of that conversation. I want to do that. Occasionally I'll make time to listen to somebody else and talk about somebody else. Okay, But the true Christian faith calls for a death to oneself. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, says the Apostle Paul. Jesus said, if anyone wishes to come after me, 
He must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake in the Gospels will save it. He's not talking about literal martyrdom, although it's been the case for some of our past brothers and sisters in Christ. He's not talking about that, but he's saying, essentially, it's the same thing with Paul. Essentially, I've been crucified. It's not my life anymore. If I'm a Christian, if I'm a follower of Christ, I live my life for him. And what his purposes are, it's not my priorities, it's God's priorities. It's not building my kingdom, it's building his kingdom. It's not proclaiming my goodness, it's proclaiming his goodness. So the true Christian faith is about God's kingdom, where we act as ambassadors proclaiming the goodness of him and his kingdom. The true Christian faith promotes a love of others, not self. And it takes effort. Okay, we make it so mamby-pamby. Okay, who do you avoid? You're not loving them. Who do you just, would you really like to smack in the Lord? That's not loving them. It takes effort. This is harder. A, a love for others is harder. And, and to be honest, to be frank, you need the power of the Holy Spirit to do it. You need Christ living within you to do it. The true Christian faith recognizes that the children of God are citizens of his holy city. Yet we look to the welfare of the city of man that he has entrusted us with. We are good citizens in the city of man, Heber, Overgard, surrounding areas. We're good citizens here, but our citizenship, our priority over our citizenship here in Navajo County is the citizenship in God's kingdom. I love America, and yet I am so distraught at the direction that she is going. Uh, I am frightened and afraid for what she is becoming and what she will be like for my daughters and my hopefully future granddaughters should the, or grandchildren, should the Lord tarry. I'm not going to disown any grandsons. I'll take those two. Um, but grandchildren, should the Lord tarry? I am stunned, absolutely stunned at how many people run on a platform of hating America and actually get elected. I can't believe it. In today's passage, we pick up with Daniel. So Daniel, who through divine providence has been given insight to many worldly kingdoms, the most of which do not concern him at all in the least amount. He will be dead long and gone before any of them come about. And yet God has entrusted him with this insight into these worldly kingdoms. And yet he sees the impact that all of this is going to have on humanity and, and the place and the role it plays in God's program of justice and righteousness and salvation and redemption for humanity. And it does not leave him unmoved. He's motivated by what he sees in terms of human suffering. He's uh, encouraged by what he sees in way of God's victory. It doesn't leave him unmoved, even though he probably won't leave, live to see any of it. So let's pick it up in Daniel chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. It says, In the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, the king, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, subsequent to the one which appeared to me previously. I looked in the vision, and while I was looking, I was in the citadel of Susa, which is in the province of Elam, and I looked in the vision, and I myself was beside the Ulai Canal. So this is the third year of King Belshazzar. This is Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. This is his grandson. So we're still in the Babylonian Empire. If you go back to Daniel chapter 2 and the vision of the statue, it's the head of gold, okay? You go to where we were last week in Daniel chapter 7, okay? He's still within the kingdom of the lion, the winged lion. This is where he's at. It hasn't progressed any at this point, okay? None of the significance of, cha of his chapter 2 statue dream has come to pass yet. Same could be said about last week's chapter 7 vision as well. None of that has come, to, come into play, at the time of this vision, Babylon was still the better part of a decade away from falling, given that it was only the third year of Belshazzar. And we, we have a conflict in how long he reigned. Some say 11 years, some say 14 years. But he's the better part of a decade. Okay? 
Uh, Belshazzar would still reign for a better part of a decade. The Lion's Den episode, which took place in Persia, Susa, not in Babylon, okay? The Lion's Den episode of chapter 6 was still the better part of a decade away. In fact, the only one of Daniel's visions or interpretations of visions that has come to pass thus far is the one of Nebuchadnezzar's humbling in chapter 4, where he was given the mind of an animal for seven years. But thus far, none of the visions regarding the succession of kingdoms had come to pass. He is still living in Babylon. He's still in the head of gold and the winged lion, which makes for a couple interesting observations right off the bat in this vision. He says in his vision, he was in the citadel of Susa in the province of Elam, and he looked in the vision, and he was beside the Ulai Canal. So what's interesting about that? Well, for starters, Susa, okay, is the capital of the Persian Empire, not the Babylonian Empire. And the Persian Empire hadn't, he didn't know what it was. He had a vision it was coming, but he didn't have names and dates. Okay, he's going to be given that. And that's what's so interesting about it. He's given that by the angel and the interpretation Okay, um, so it leads to a couple of questions. Had he ever been to Susa? Perhaps he had under Nebuchadnezzar's reign on king's official business. Maybe, okay. Um, was the vision that he saw about Susa, or was he actually in Susa when he had the vision? Was he there on the king's business? Because Susa was there, just was still under Babylonian rule. Interestingly enough, history seems to imply that Daniel died in Susa and is buried there. In Iran, Persia is Iran. So we're not sure about the contents of the vision. Uh, We're not sure all about those details, but we know that the contents of the vision would certainly impact Susa. So what is clear is is that Daniel understood his vision to be a subsequent vision. Okay, He says that right there at the end of verse 1. This this vision was subsequent to the one which appeared to me previously. a unique vision given to him was chapter 7. The rest were Nebuchadnezzar's or Belshazzar's, all right? So he understood it was subsequent to the vision that he had previously, two years prior to be exact. It would provide more details into the context of the transition of power between two of last week's beasts, which don't even exist yet. And it would, for the first time, really involve the Holy Land, Okay, which up to this point was really left out of the picture. None of his previous visions had anything to do with Israel or Judah. So with all of this context in place, let's put ourselves in Daniel's shoes for a minute. If Daniel, Daniel were selfish, what would he be most concerned with? Okay, what would he be most concerned with? If you were Daniel and you were taken from your homeland, Judea, decades earlier, many decades earlier, whose future would you really want to know about? You'd want to know about your homeland's future, Judea's future. That's who you'd want to know about. If you were Daniel and you knew by God's word through the prophet Jeremiah that your people would be in exile for 70 years, and that time was almost up. You'd almost been there 70 years. You're at like 63. Okay? You knew that time was almost up. What, what, would, the thing, what, would, what would be the thing that you were anticipating the most? Okay? You'd be anticipating the time of the release, the time they could go back, the end of their sentence. They could go home to Judea. And you would view this as probably the most significant future event uh, that you could imagine talking about. So this is Daniel's mindset when he receives this vision. Uh, He's thinking about that, but God's given him a vision about other kingdoms. And, and so here's what I want you to see, because you have a Bible in your lap right now, and you have Daniel's prophecy given to you. He shared it with you. He was told to keep it secret for a little while, but a little while's up, and he gave it to you. All right, so here's your first point. Like Daniel, uh, God has entrusted us with knowledge that far surpasses the scope of our lives in the flesh. God has entrusted us with knowledge that far surpasses the scope of our lives in the flesh. With this knowledge that he's given us throughout all of Scripture, okay, you've been given all the knowledge of prophets. I don't think the prophets received any knowledge that they held back from us, okay, unless it was by God's decree. But why would God tell one of them if it wasn't to tell his people, okay? With this knowledge, we can not be only concerned with 
21st century Christians. We can't only be concerned with American Christians, okay? We can't be only concerned with Baptist Christianity. We got to be concerned for all of it, okay, for all of it. God's entrusted us knowledge about all the kingdom, all of his kingdom through all the ages. Just on Fox News this morning, an article, okay, about increased, one, how rapidly the Christian church is growing in Iran, Iran, and how, and how much persecution against our brothers and sisters in Christ are increased. Most American Christians aren't going to worry about persecution until it's at our front door. But we have Christian brother, new Christian brothers and sisters standing firm for the faith, and persecution is on the increase because the church is growing. It's shocking how the church grows under persecution. Maybe that's the American church's problem. But it's going to increase. It's going to change. But for the most part, we're not concerned about it till it's at our, our front door. And yet God's entrusted us with knowledge concerning our brothers and sisters in Christ, past, present, future, all over the world. He's given us knowledge for that reason. And so our love for them, our love for those in the future, our loves for those that are in other parts of the world, uh, we, we must be motivated by that love. We must look and pray for our persecuted brothers in all four corners of the world. We must look and pray for our brothers living in war-torn countries. We must be very concerned for future generations, these kids, my kids. We need to be concerned for them. That's why we continue as a church, and we need to look and make sure, church, check ourselves and make sure kids are welcome here, okay? We need to build a building for future generations to be ministered to, Okay, we need to continue and volunteer and serve in children's ministry to be concerned for future generations of God's people, God's children. We must thank God and be encouraged by our Christians and brothers who have fought the good fight of the faith in generations past in every corner of the globe. In some, we must be concerned with all of the activity of God's kingdom and all of its history and all of its future, not just that little tiny minuscule speck that applies to us. That applies to us. You know, we're sitting there looking at our little lives through the lens of a microscope. We need to sit up and cast our gaze a little wider. Cast our gaze a little wider. Verse 3, the vision. All right. He says, Then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a ram which had two horns was standing in front of the canal. Now the two horns were long, but one was longer than the other. <clears throat> with the longer one coming up last. I saw the ram budding westward, northward, and southward, and no other beast could stand before him, nor was there anyone to rescue from his power, but he did as he pleased, and he magnified himself. So this ram is uh, the same as the bear in the chapter 7 version. This is, the ram represents the same kingdom as that the bear represented in the chapter 7 vision. It represents the Medo-Persian kingdom, which did not exist yet. Okay? Well, how do we know that it represents them? And this is really cool. Check this out. The angel tells us. Verse 20. Go look at verse 20. The ram which you saw with the two horns represents the kings of Media and Persia. Wow, look at that. That's cool. Interpreting visions made easy by God. Let Scripture interpret Scripture, okay? His messenger just tells you what it means and who it is. You know, and, and Daniel's probably like, who's the kings of Media and Persia? He probably heard of Persia as a land and Media as a land, but who were their kings? He didn't know, okay? And by the same very, very, very reliable hermeneutic method, we learn that the goat we're about to be introduced to is Greece in verse 21. Look what it says. Shaggy goat represents the kingdom of Greece. You probably never even heard of that. Daniel probably never even heard of it. Okay? Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. So there you are. See how easy that is? You're all on your way to getting a certificate of completion in eschatology and hermeneutics. Uh, I'll have Dottie order them for you. All right. The ram had two horns and was standing in front of the canal as that would make sense, since the Ulai Canal is a, it's a fake river that goes through the city. It's a diverted river that goes through the city of Susa, the capital of Persia. Again, like the bear that was raised up on one side last week, one of the ram's horns was a little bit bigger than the other one, signifying 
that Persia was the stronger of the two in the Mede-Persian alliance. But together they expanded their kingdom westward. They butted westward into Babylon and to the south and, and to the north. All right, that's what rams do. When I used to herd sheep up on the Navajo Indian Reservation uh, as a kid in junior high, it was pretty fun. They're pretty harmless. You're, you're bringing the sheep back into the sheep pen, and you're fine. You're kind of shooing them in and rushing them in. But when the ram, if you had a ram in the flock, you kind of stood back a little bit because he just might take a cheap shot on his way in. He would knock you on your tail if you weren't careful. You kinda, you, you, the sheep weren't scary. The goats weren't particularly scary. The ram, you needed to pay attention to him if he was in your near vicinity. All right? So Cyrus, uh, the most prominent king of that, that alliance, and Persia were pretty unstoppable in their conquests. But being unstoppable on the offense does not mean that you are not vulnerable on the defense. Right, coach? You can be pretty unstoppable on the offense. Doesn't mean they can't score on you. Okay? Which was... What makes what we see next in the next verse so surprising? So let's go on to verse 5. While I was observing, behold, a male goat was coming from the west over the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. And the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came up to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing in front of the canal, and rushed at him in his mighty wrath. I saw him come beside the ram, and he was enraged at him, and he struck the ram and shattered his two horns, and the ram had no strength to withstand him, so he hurled him to the ground and trampled on him, and there was none to rescue the ram from his power. Then the male goat magnified himself exceedingly, but as soon as he was mighty, the large horn was broken, and in its place there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of the heaven. Typically, in the natural order of things, the ram is going to win this fight. The ram is going to win this fight. And just to make sure, I watched a lot of YouTube videos of rams and goats fighting. Why that happens all the time and why people are videotaping it, I don't know, but it's there. Okay? It's there. So the goat literally comes flying in, verse 5, without touching the ground and takes out the ram. It just hits it with all of its force. All right, the funny, this is a funny looking goat. It had a great big obvious horn between his eyes. Sounds more like a unicorn or a rhinoceros. Now we know that this is Greece because the angel told us. So this horn is most likely Alexander the Great who conquered the entire known world by the age of 32 years of age. He was swift. He was fast. He defeated armies that were bigger and stronger than him, but he did it with his swiftness. I mean, he was attacking them before they were ready for battle. And he went in and was fierce. The goat is the same as the four-headed leopard and with the four wings of the bird, thus the flying swiftness of it all that we saw last week in chapter 7. All right? So soon the large horn was broken. Four other horns took its place. These are the four parts of the Greek empire. After Alexander the Great died at 32 years of age, he had four generals that basically split Uh, governance up among themselves. You had the Egyptian or the Ptolemaic kingdom, which was basically Greek rule in Egypt, all right? Then there was the Macedonian kingdom, what we would know uh, and what would become, and the apostle Paul would know as Greek, Greece proper, all right? Uh, Then there was the Seleucid empire, which would encompass most of the ancient Babylonian kingdom and headquartered out of modern day Syria. And then there was the uh, Lysimachus empire, And what was known in Bible times is Asia Minor. Today in modern times, it's known as Turkey. And all of them set out on this great endeavor of Hellenization. They wanted uniformity in their kingdom. Everybody had to adopt Greek culture, Greek language, everything. That's why our New Testament's written in Greek, because of their efforts. All right, they made it the official language. Like today, the official language of most business transactions, air traffic control stuff is English. Okay, well, the Greeks Greeks did the same thing. It was called Hellenization. And they spread out towards, not all the way, but towards the four winds of heaven. That is, they spread out toward uh, all the areas of the earth that the will of God pertains to, which is all of it. Had God not set boundaries for them, they would have kept going. They would have kept going. So here it is. 
The ram is strong and powerful, and then the goat comes and defeats the ram, and the goat's rule is spread out among four smaller but significant kingdoms. But Daniel already had all this information, didn't he? He already knew all of this. The bear was replaced by the leopard in chapter 7. And in chapter 2, the statue, the chest and arms of silver were replaced by the belly and the thighs of the bronze. But at the time of this vision, Daniel still lived in the winged lion. He still lived in the head of gold. He lived in the Babylonian kingdom, the Babylonian empire. So this vision thus far does not really provide any new information. That comes next. And what comes next... uh, kind of got Daniel excited for a moment, and then it horrified him. And then it horrified him. So let's check out verse 9. So out of those four, let's go back up to verse 8. The male goat magnified himself exceedingly, but as soon as he was mighty, the large conspicuous horn between the eyes, Alexander the Great was broken. He died, most likely poisoned. Most likely poisoned. And in his place, there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. These are the four parts, the four parts of the empire. Out of one of them came forth a rather small horn, which grew exceedingly great towards the south and toward the east and toward the beautiful land. The beautiful land. So out of these four horns or four kingdoms came another small horn which grew exceedingly great toward the south, Egypt, okay, toward the east. Babylon, Persia, and toward the beautiful land. What and where is the beautiful land? Daniel knew. Daniel knew what the beautiful land was. It was home. It was Judea. The promise of God was true. They would be let go after 70 years, and they would go home, and they would rebuild, and they because it had been laid desolate. It was a haunt of jackals, desert animals. There was nobody there. They would go back. They would rebuild. They would rebuild the temple, and they could go and make sacrifice and worship God as they were supposed to, not tiptoeing around all of these pagan idolaters and being made to fear the fiery furnace and the lion's den, which hadn't happened yet. But uh, it would be great, right? Everything would be great. This is Daniel's first vision that he's received that had anything to do with the future of his homeland. His interest is peaked at this point. And at this point, this is where a normal person would finally start paying attention. But what he sees next horrifies him. Horrifies him. Daniel chapter 8, verse 10. It grew up to the host of heaven, the army of heaven. Probably a little hyperbole there, but let's keep going. <clears throat> and caused some of the host and some of the stars to fall to the earth, and it trampled them down. It even magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the host, and it removed the regular sacrifice from him, and the place of his sanctuary was thrown down. And on account of the transgression, the host will be given over to the horn along with the regular sacrifice, and it will fling truth to the ground and perform its will and prosper. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one, angels, said uh, to that particular one that was speaking, how long will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply while the transgression causes horror, horror? So as to allow both the holy place and the host to be trampled. He said to me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be properly restored. Pretty reliable history of that period of time identifies this little horn as Theos, God, small g, Theos, Antiochus IV, also known, self-named as Epiphanes. Epiphanes. He named himself Epiphanes, that is, the illustrious God. This is who he thought he was. His critics in Jerusalem and Judea, they didn't like calling him Epiphanes. They called him uh, Epimenes, which means the madman. He was insane. He was crazy. He grew out of the uh, Seleucid Empire by deposing his nephew. He killed his own nephew to take his throne. He sat out on a hard course of Hellenization, including strict uniformity of worship. 
And by force, he went in and made the, uh, uh, the Jewish people act like Greeks, okay? And he went down uh, the, the, to the Ptolemaic, I want to call them the Ptolemites, but it's not, the Ptolemaic Empire, and he wanted to take over Egypt and make them uh, act like Greeks. The Jews posed a unique stubbornness in the refusal to worship any other god than their one true god, but Epiphany set out to do it by force. He killed tens of thousands of them. He sacked Jerusalem. He killed the godly high priest, Ananias III, along with quite a few of the Jewish worshipers. And he replaced Ananias with his younger brother, Jason, who was a, a Hellenizer. He, he was a Jew that was sympathetic to the Greek movement. So he puts him in as the high priest. But soon, a little bit later, a certain Jew named Menelaus bribed Epiphanes. This is a case of simony. Simony's buying a religious office. Okay, uh, he, he buys this office before it was even a thing, so he bribes Epiphanes for the office of high priest, and Epiphanes uh, accepts the bribe. He forbid immediately the morning and the evening sacrifice in any of the appointed festivals of the Jewish people. All right? He went on down to Alexandria, Egypt, to challenge the, the, the Ptolemies, but was turned away by a strange new power. He ran into this group of people in a general from some land called Rome, the Romans. And this is where the saying, lying in the sand, came from. He, this Roman general confronts him, and he must have had a pretty huge battle array because Epiphanes didn't back down from anybody. And while they were talking, he says, look, if you do this, you're going to fight the entire Roman Empire, which wasn't a thing quite yet, but it was coming. And what he did, Epiphany says, well, I need to go and think about it. Think if I want to attack you, and I'm going to take... Egypt with it. Well, the Roman general drew a line in the sand all the way around him. He says, before you cross that line in the sand, you better give Rome an, a an answer. Well, Epiphanes thought about it, and he must have, it must have been a huge army. It must have been a huge army. He decided to retreat. But he was mad, and he was prideful, and he was arrogant. He had never been, he had never stood down before. He had never been defeated, even though there wasn't a fight. He had never been defeated. So he goes back, uh, uh, going back to Syria, and on the way through Israel, stops in Jerusalem. Well, here was a problem, okay? Uh, rumor had reached Jerusalem that he had died. So Jason, the, the deposing high priest who was also deposed, he decided to go and uh, siege Jerusalem and depose Mel Melanius. Uh, Melanius, I'm sorry, all these names. On his return from Egypt, lo and behold, dead Epiphanes, who's not dead, shows up. Okay? He's not dead. He finds out about the rebellion, and he slaughters the Jews by tens of thousands of people. And because the rebellion was all about the priesthood and control of the temple and their right to worship as they wanted to, he defiled it by slaughtering an unclean pig on the altar uh, he set up an idol of Zeus. He would later sacrifice humans on the altar. And, and he set up this idol of Zeus in the temple and demanded his worship. This was an abomination to God. This is the abomination of desolation in the past. This is it. Okay? Uh, it's an abomination, and it also meant that the temple was desolate. How do we know the temple was desolate? What does desolate mean? It was devoid of God's presence. How do we know it was devoid of God's presence? Because he lived to do it without his face melting off. That's why. Had God been in there, he would have melted in his presence. It would have been over, done. God was out of there. This extreme desolation and persecution and blaspheming of the temple would last for 2,300 evenings and mornings. It, if it's meant to be, that means complete days, a little more than six and a half years. If the meaning is 2,300 individual sacrifices, a little less three and, than a, three and a quarter years. The six and a half years matches the history a little bit better. Now, much has been made, listen to me, much has been made to try and, and, and work this out and make this about the timing of the great tribulation future, okay? But this isn't talking about that. That, the great tribulation, is still future for us. This account, to us, is a historical event. Okay, we're in 2024. This was like 170 B.C. So this is like almost 2,200 years ago. All right, to Daniel, it's yet a future event. It's about 250 years out from Daniel. 
and he wouldn't live to see it. All right? He wouldn't live to see this. But what it is is it's a foreshadowing of what was to come and many times over. That's what it was. It's a foreshadowing. It, it would happen again with some differences. 240 years later in 70 AD when the temple was raised, it was desecrated. Uh, all sacrifice stopped to this day in 70 AD. The temple was demolished okay, um, by Titus, a Roman general. And, and so all that, it was a, a forewarning of that. Also, we know that the little horn... Out of the four horns of this chapter is not the same as the little horn out of the ten horns in chapter 7. Why? That little horn was revealed out of the ten horns of the fourth beast, the Roman Empire. Okay? This little horn is very specifically revealed from the four horns or the four heads of the third beast, the Greek Empire. They are different little horns, though they represent the same anti-God, blasphemous, anti-Christ, destructive spirit. Epiphanes certainly operated in the spirit of the Antichrist, but he was not the final Antichrist. He was a type, a type of him who was to come, a prototype, I guess you could say. Just like Joshua was a type of Christ who was to come, and so was Noah's Ark, a means of salvation, a type of Christ who was to come. And the ram who took Isaac's place on the altar are all types of Christ, but they are not Christ. So, so it is here. Okay, Melchizedek was a type of Christ, but he's not Christ, all right? So it is here. Epiphanes was a type of the Antichrist, but certainly not the final Antichrist. Remember, 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, okay? 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, if you've got your Bibles, there we go. This is what John wrote 2,000 years ago. Children, it is the last hour. Was John wrong? No, it was the last hour. It is the last hour, and just as you heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. They've already come. They're already on the scene. From this, we know that it is the last hour. So what I want you to see to this is all this stuff that's coming up that we're all just kind of getting a little indigestion over, all this anti-Christian rhetoric and stuff isn't anything new. It's new to us. It's new to us, but it's not new to the children of God, all right? So your next point is this. Uh, Daniel's vision of the little horn teaches us a consistent pattern, pattern of, uh, of satanic opposition to the work of God among his people. Daniel's vision of the little horn teaches us a consistent pattern of satanic opposition to the work of God among his people. Okay, so let's go back to Daniel. Let's put ourselves in Daniel's shoes. Let's get all subjective as though we're Daniel, okay? Not the best method, but let's do it. He wants the 70 years to be up. He wants, if not himself because of his advanced age, and it looks like he never did make it back. He died in Persia, okay? He wants at least his people to go back to Jerusalem. He wants the temple rebuilt, and he wants the sacrifice to resume in worship of the one true God. And he wants the beautiful land to be occupied and cultivated again. Well, the, ver the vision confirms all of that. But then the horror. How bad was it? Well, let's take a look. Verse 15. All right. When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, oh, I sought to understand it. And behold, standing before me was one whom looked like a man, either an angel or perhaps a pre-incarnate Christ. And I heard the voice of a man between the banks of Uli, and he called out and said, Gabriel, give this man an understanding of the vision. So he came to where I was standing, and when he came, I was frightened, and I fell on my face. But he said to me, son of man, understand that the vision pertains to the time of the end. Okay, there's a twofold meaning here. Now while he was talking with me, I sank into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. But he touched me and he made me stand upright. He said, behold, I'm going to let you know what will occur at the final period of the indignation. 
for it pertains to the appointed time of the end. All right. Daniel was given the understanding of this dream. He didn't come up with it on his own. It wasn't his own doing. He was given it to him. The holy angel Gabriel, a warrior, fierce warrior, okay, uh, terrified him in his fallen, weak human state. He comes up, Daniel's like on the ground. He's like, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. And, and so he tells him the meaning of the dream, and, and there's this uh, double meaning that pertains to the end. Okay, the end refers to the days of trouble, the days of indignation. We see that in verse 19. It's the final period of indignation. This was God's judgment on Israel for their idolatry. And all the ways that Israel had strayed. This was the end uh, where God, even though the 70 years is long gone, things are still not great for Israel. But this event and the restoration, the final restoration of the temple would lead the way to the coming of their Savior, whom they needed, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. All right? But it also gives us a picture of the very end, the end of all days, the eschatos, the last things. So it's a double meaning there, all right? But this is also this picture of what Epiphanes did to the Jerusalem temple and and Jerusalem itself uh, is a a type of the final end times, as I just explained. And so he explains it, and he understands how the temple is defiled and desecrated. I mean, an unclean pig. And, And not only that, he forced the Jews to eat unclean pigs. He took away all their the things they were allowed to eat, and he brought in herds of swine and said, you'll eat it, and you'll like it, okay? Well, they liked it. It was bacon. Who doesn't like it? But they knew they were offending God. They knew they were offending God. And he saw this, and he saw the horror that took place in the temple. He saw an idol of Zeus. He didn't even know who Zeus was. But he saw this pagan idol set up in the place of the holy God and sacrifice being made, and he knew the temple was desecrated. And, and, and here's the thing. It, it doesn't read quite right, but we see it in verse 18. It, it was so dreadful. It says in verse 18, now he was talking with me. I sank into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. That's not what happened. He passed out. He fainted. He fainted. He didn't go to sleep. You don't go to sleep while a mighty warrior of heaven is talking to you. You're you're, you're, all, you're on full alert, but it can be so shocking that you pass out cold. You faint. And, and the vision and the desecration and what he saw was so dreadful, he passed out. He fainted. The angel had to wake him up and make him stand up. Okay? But what I want you to see through all this and what, what, what Daniel will eventually get to see, he doesn't see it yet, okay? And, and this applies to us. There are dreadful accounts of persecution, dreadful accounts of persecution, past, present in our very day, and accounts of persecution in the future. But what you got to see is God sustains his people and his kingdom through all of it. God sustains his kingdom and his people through all of it. It's easy to ask with the psalmist, if you want to turn there, I'm going to read the whole thing because it applies. uh, Psalm 73, if you're still writing, there are dreadful accounts of persecution, past, present, and future, but God sustains his people and his kingdom through it all. Let's go to Psalm 73. Uh, The 73rd Psalm says this, it's easy to ask with the psalmist, why do the wicked prosper? Why do we have a history of them if God is sovereign, if God is good, if God is in control? Well, it's because we're being subjective when we say that. We're being subjective. We're not being objective. We're not seeing it from heaven. We're not seeing it from God's perspective. 73rd Psalm says this, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart, which Israel never was, but we try. The church never was either, but we try. But as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. My steps had almost slipped. Why? For I was envious of the arrogant. I was envious of the arrogant as I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pains in their death, and their body is fat. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Their garment of violence covers them. Their eye bulges from fatness. The imaginations of their heart 
run riot. They mock and wickedly speak of oppression. They speak from on high. They have set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue parades through the earth. Therefore, as people return to this place and waters of abundance are drunk by them, they say, how does God know? And is there knowledge with the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked. These are the wicked. Same wicked today, by the way. And always at ease. They have increased in wealth. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and washed my hands in innocent, for, for I have been stricken all day long and chastened every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, behold, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. When I pondered to understand this, it was troublesome in my sight until I came to the sanctuary of God. And there, then I perceived their end. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. How they are destroyed in a moment. They are utterly swept away by sudden terrors. Like a dream when one awakes, O Lord, when aroused, you will despise their form, their very existence. When my heart was embittered and I was pierced within, then I was senseless and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You have taken hold of my right hand. With your counsel, you will guide me and afterward receive me to glory. Who have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you will perish. You have destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord my the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all your works. We don't have to fear persecution. We don't have to fear persecution unto death. Our knees might knock, our hearts might melt, but we don't have to fear it. We have the ultimate victory in death. Psalm uh, 116 verse 15 says this, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his godly ones. We view it as a departure. We, we view it as like we're afraid of death. God's like it's a homecoming. Come to Papa. Come to Papa. We don't have to fear death. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 6-9, through 9, the Apostle Paul, who would die a martyr's death, says this, Therefore, being always of good courage, and knowing that while we were at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. This isn't our final destination. This isn't where we should be content. This isn't where we should want to be. Because right now, while we're at home in the body here, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith in what we know to be true in heaven, not by sight, what we see in the world, we are of good courage, I say, and we should prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Philippians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul, man, I'm hard-pressed. I don't know which to choose. If I live, it's great. I'll keep serving you. But if I die, I'm with the Lord. I'm, man, I just don't. That's a tough choice. That's a tough choice. I would rather die and be with the Lord, as the Apostle Paul says. But I think I'll remain on for your good. That's Eric Wood's paraphrase. Okay? We don't have to worry about that stuff. Daniel chapter 8, verse 20. We already read this. We'll cover it really quick. The ram which you saw. Here's the interpretation. With the two horns represents the king's of Media and Persia, the shaggy goat represents the kingdom of Greece, and the large horn that is between his eyes is the first king. So we know that's Alexander the Great. The broken horn and the four horns that arose in its place represent four kingdoms which will arise from his nation, although they won't quite have the same power. In the latter period of their rule, okay, uh, when the transgressors have run their course, a king will arise insolent and skilled in intrigue. So in the latter period of the rule, that is, there is the ram uh, and goat, Persia and Greece, okay? Uh, this other king is going to arise, and the other four kings, the four horns, at the end of their rule, uh, this other one's going to arise. And this king who arises is uh, insolent, all right? 
He's insolent and skilled in intrigue. His power will be mighty, but not by his own power. He will destroy to an extraordinary degree and prosper and perform his will. He will destroy mighty men and the holy people. And through his shrewdness, he will cause deceit to succeed by his influence. And he will magnify himself in his heart. And he will destroy many while they are at ease. He will even oppose the prince of princes. But he will be broken without human agency. Who is this? When the transgressors have run their course, that is, sinful in Israel, have run their course of discipline. This king, this Greek horn, Epiphanes, will arise. He's insolent. He's stubbornly evil and disobedient to God. And he's skilled in intrigue. He's a smart dude. We like to say that we fall into sin because we don't know any better. That is not the case here. He pursued sin and he was good at it. Okay? He made right wrong and his wrong right just because it was insulting to God. That was his motivation because it was insulting to God. It says his power is mighty. He had satanic power, but he still was not out of the bounds of God's sovereignty. He had the power to destroy to an extraordinary degree. Evil people are destructive. Take a look at our major cities. Destroy mighty men and holy people. They'll go after anyone who might threaten their power or actually be righteous. Shrewdness. These are not just haphaz- they're not just haphazardly evil. They are cunning and thoughtful. They think about how to be deceitful, how to be evil. And they use deceit to succeed. People will believe a lie, and the lie will be regarded as truth. Are things starting to click with y'all? Okay? They magnify. They think they are their own God. God is who I allow him to be. He does not care. And he destroys many at ease. They take advantage of comfortable, complacent people who just want to be left alone. How many of us just want to be left alone? But we're complacent and comfortable. And we're not going to take action until it's at our doorstep. Until it's at our doorstep. They destroy many of these, and they oppose the prince of princes, God, but particularly God the Son, Jesus Christ. As dreadful as the Antichrist sounds, we live right now with the spirit of the Antichrist as we speak. We live with such people, such leaders right now, people who deny the intelligent design of the creator and the natural order of the creation. Why? Because they love their sin. People who slaughter innocent babies. Why? Because they love their sexual sin. People who oppress the proclaimers of righteousness because, why? They love their sin. People who get rich on the backs of the working poor and the overtaxed. Why? Because they love their greed. You're supposed to settle for less while they get rich. Okay? People who enslave the vulnerable with their so-called compassionate welfare and keep the Native American locked on the reservation, okay, and the African American uh, as much as they can isolated to their inner city Section 8 housing, okay, and their compassionate welfare that enslaves them because they love their power. If you want to eat, you got to vote for us. People who lie and deceive and censor the truth to push their godless agenda. I don't know if y'all saw the hubbub on the news. One of the uh, people that was being interviewed said the problem with these dangerous Christian nationals, the problem with these dangerous Christians is they actually believe that the rights come from God, not the government. They actually said this. It's like, okay, I can tell you graduated from Harvard. You've never read the Constitution. We have been endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights. That's what the Constitution says. That's what our founding fathers said. These people actually believe it. Yeah, we do. We do believe it. The holy ones of the Most High can never will never feel at home in this fallen world. But we will not fear, for we will be courageous and proclaim his goodness even to those who hate him. 
even to those who hate him. We cannot feel, if you're comfortable at this world, if you're like hunky-dory, you're, you're digging stuff, man, if you're not getting a little squeamish about some stuff, if you ain't passing out a little bit, you need to be working out your faith with fear and trembling. Jesus said this, Matthew chapter 10, verse 24 through 39. Oh, there it is. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. <clears throat> it is enough for the disciple that he became like his teacher and the slave like his master. If they have called the head of the house Beelzebul, saying if they called Jesus Satan, how much more will they malign the members of his household? Therefore, look what Jesus says. Jesus' own words, do not fear them. For there is nothing concealed that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the darkness, I want you to speak it in the light. And what you hear whispered in your ear, proclaim it upon the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body and are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to both destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a cent? And yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered, so do not fear, for you are more valuable than many sparrows. Therefore, anyone who confesses me before men, I will confess him before the Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. Jesus' own words, guys. How's this with milk toast, soft, chosen Jesus? All right? Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against his mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. He who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it, and he who has lost his life for my sake, will find it. I love you guys. I love my wife more. I love my kids more, but I love Jesus most. I love Jesus most. Absolutely. And those who want to deny Christ and live with the spirit of the Antichrist, controlling the river move like in Epiphanies, it says here back in Daniel chapter 8, verse uh, 25, Okay, it says that they will be broken without human agency. God ends his rule. History states that his death, which was actually in Persia, was very painful and gruesome. Witnesses that saw it looked at him, and he was writhing. I've been a hospice chaplain. I've watched a lot of people die. And the vast majority of people die very peaceful. They're asleep by the time they die. It's very, very peaceful. I've seen a few people... Uh, Stuff didn't look like it was going very well. They were in a lot of pain. We couldn't give them enough morphine. But very few, very few accounts of that. But they said of Epiphanes that when he died, it was as though it was very painful and gruesome, as though he was being tortured, but not by human hands. Isn't that weird? Eventually, a group of guerrilla warfare rebels, the temple was eventually... Their, their knowledge of the Judean hills, they were able to come in swiftly and inflict damage on Epiphanes and his armies and the Maccabean result, uh, which the victory was given to them by the power of God and the temple was reconsecrated and it's celebrated in the Jewish holiday of Hanukkah. That's what we're celebrating at Hanukkah or they celebrate at Hanukkah. What's the result of all this? Verse 26 it says, the vision of evenings and mornings, which has been told is true, but keep the vision secret, for it pertains to many days in the future. Daniel wouldn't live to see any of this. But what was the impact on Daniel? It didn't bother him. It wasn't going to impact him. What was the impact? Well, he says right here, then I, Daniel, was exhausted and sick for days. Then I got up again. And carried on with the king's business. But I was astounded at the vision, and there was none to explain it. He, he heard of Greek. He heard of Persia from the angels. He had no idea what that meant on earth. 
The vision left Daniel sick for so many days, but here's the thing. He did not retire from the world in view of the evil days that were coming that he had seen. Like me, I want to go find that cave and wrestle a bear and get comfy with him. Just like, I'm done with y'all. Okay, people are nuts. All right? It's tempting. I want to go, like, find an Aleutian Island, uninhabited, and just, like, go there. And then just turn off the radio because I don't want to hear it. But he didn't do that. He didn't retire from the world in view of the evil days that were coming. Nor did he live aloof in a visionary high. Well, I know what's going to happen. Y'all are toast. Huh. He didn't do that either. He got up and he went back to work. Doing the kings, the earthly kings, in this case Belshazzar's business. He got up and he went to work. Because that was the work that God, the king of kings, gave him. He put him in that place. He put him in that palace. He got up and went back to work. The old circuit riding preacher John Wesley one day, he was riding his horse to a preaching engagement. He was stopped by a stranger on the side of the road who recognized him. He'd been to one of his sermons. And so he stopped by the stranger who asked him what would he do if he knew that Christ was going to Return at noon the next day. Wesley reached back into his saddlebag. He retrieved his diary, and he read out his appointments and engagements for the rest of that day and for the morning of the next day. And he said to him, that, dear sir, is what I would do. That, dear sir, is what I would do. We cannot retreat. We got to be engaged. We got to be busier than ever in the Lord's work. We have to. Mark chapter 13, verse 33 through 37. Take heed, keep on the alert, for you do not know when the appointed time will come. It is like a man who, away on a journey, who upon leaving his house and putting his slaves in charge, assigning to each one his task, also commanded the doorkeeper to stay on the alert. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, in case he should come suddenly and find you asleep. What I say to you, I say to all, be on the alert. We can't just keep comfortably sliding through. We got to do what we're doing. Go to work, but be an ambassador for kingdom at work. Go visit your family. Be a, an ambassador for your king with your family. Be busy about his work. Serve in the church. Study his word. Know who he is. Your final point of this is the soldiers of the cross can never retreat from nor disengage the enemy. Soldiers of the cross can never retreat from and hide nor can we ever just disengage the enemy. Can we just stop fighting? But we man our post, our God-given post, whatever it is, as a father, teacher, policeman, retiree, grandfather, whatever. We man our post until relieved of duty by Christ our captain. Until we are relieved of duty by Christ our captain. We never abandon post. We never, there's never a time, okay, where we're allowed to do that. We stay busy about our king's work, no matter how bad it gets here on earth, no matter how sickening the news is when it exhausts us and sicks us, makes us sick for days, okay? Dottie and I both at noon on Wednesday had had enough. We Dottie comes in and says, Pastor, i got to take a mental health day. And I said, I do too. We both went home. Okay, but we're never allowed to just check out. Check out completely. We man our post until relieved of our duty by Christ, our captain. We proclaim his goodness. Why? Because we're motivated by a love for others. And if you're here and you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've never put your faith in him, if he's called you, you felt it in the spirit, and you think, man, I should respond, but I don't know. I'll wait and see how it plays out. I'll see if it gets really bad first. And a lot of people have that attitude. I'll wait until the last minute and see how bad it gets. You never know 
tomorrow your life could be demanded from you. So I want to encourage you, I want to call you, I want to plead with you to put your faith in Jesus, repent of your sins, live as a holy ambassador the rest of your days for his kingdom. How do you want to represent the best king? Okay? How do you want to do it? I want to ask you to put your faith and your trust and your hope in Christ, our captain. Because we're at war, folks. And you're on sides, whether you know it or not. You either know you're on God's side or you're on the Antichrist side. It's that simple. You're either on his side or you are not on his side. I like calling Christ my captain. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we love you and we praise you. Lord God, we know that there are angel armies, the host of heaven, that we are a part of. Lord God, we are a part. We're not nearly as intimidating or strong or courageous, but there are battles being waged right now all around us, Lord God. And we know that here we are like the stars of heaven. We are citizens of your kingdom, your city, Lord God. And we might be trampled down underfoot right here, but we have resurrection power through Jesus Christ. Lord God, let us proclaim as good ambassadors the awesomeness of our God. In Christ our captain, Christ our savior, our master, our Lord. Lord God, we thank you that he did not leave us in this helpless estate. He looked upon our helplessness And he came and lived the perfect life we could never, ever live. And he gives us that righteousness, his own righteousness. And he took the punishment that we rightly deserve, the wages of our sin, which is death, and he bore them himself on the cross, exhausting your wrath, paying the punishment, redeeming, purchasing us with his blood for your kingdom. Lord God, we thank you for the satisfaction, your satisfaction with his only perfect non-defiled sacrifice, the only truly non-defiled sacrifice ever made, your son. And you showed your satisfaction through the resurrection on the third day. And you sent your spirit upon us, not leaving us as orphans, but to guide us into all righteousness and truth, to show us our desperate need for a savior, a savior from the wrath that is to come, Lord God, the judgment that is to come, and to show us that that savior is Jesus Christ. And to extend to us an invitation to join your host. To fight alongside of angels. And to go where sometimes angels fear to tread. For your name's sake and your glory, Lord God. And to have power over our sin. Lord God, we love you and we praise you. Lord God, let us shout loudly from the rooftops. Let us tell our neighbors. Let us... Say, behold our God, look at our God, look how awesome our God is, even when they mock us. Let us get over ourselves and our pride. Their ridicule should never stop us or shame us unless we're stuck on ourselves, Lord God. Help us to recognize out of a love for them, we gotta speak through the ridicule, speak through the shame. Lord God, open our mouths, make us bold. Be with Overguard Baptist Church. Let it be a genuine lighthouse for the truth in this community, Lord God. Lord God, we love you and we praise you. We ask all of this in your precious name. Amen.